My father just celebrated his 80th birthday on August 31st, so I thought to mark the occasion, I'd like to tap into some of the vast information and knowledge he has from his long life. So, Daddy, how about if we start by talking about the early period of your life? What can you tell us about that? Well, it was quite different from now. Uh, <clears throat> I was born in 1916, in the middle of World War I, and I had the misfortune of having a fracture of my right femur, and after three operations, they finally swung it to the ceiling, and I recovered from that with a leg the right length, and that set me back a little bit in the early part of my life. <clears throat> I have had two younger brothers, and we had a very good time playing together. Sometimes we had little tiffs, but in those days, tips were handled like most mammals handled their tips, in such a way as to make sure there was no damage. When we got into any boxing or striking or anything like that, we always hit below the neck and above the waist, and so there never was any harm done, just energy was put out. Mm -hmm. I look back on that period with, with envy, wishing that things were like that now, with respect to settling differences of opinion. Uh -huh. <coughs> Can you in mention Bar where, where you were born and when? I was born in Bartlett, Texas, in a town that's on the county line between Bell and Williamson County. I lived on the Williamson wow. County side of the line, but went to school, the schools that were on the wow. Bell County side of the line. So every time I went to school, I had to go from one county to another. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the place is named Bartlett, Texas, B-A-R-T-L-E-T-T, -T, named after the early settlers there. In our, at that time, why, you were allowed to start school if your birthday occurred before September the 1st. Mm -hmm. My birthday, fortunately, was August the 31st, and I made it by just a day. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, if your parents were willing to pay a little, a rather nominal tuition, they would let you start at 6 instead of 7. Mm -hmm. Now, I guess my parents were a little ambitious for me, and they started me at 6 and paid the tuition. And so I got a fairly early start. They also had just an 11 grade system there. It was seven grades in grammar school and four grades in high school. So it kind of moved you through fairly fast. The main thing that I remember about going to school was that when I would go to school, which was a little over a half a mile away from where I lived, I'd walk by the hitching yard where the horses and buggies and the mules that pulled wagons were all hitched for the day as the farmers came to town to deliver their products cotton to the gin, and so forth. And uh, I'd go by and I'd see many more horses and buggies and wagons than I saw automobiles. Mm. The few automobiles that were there were Model T Fords, mostly. There were a few exceptions, but mostly Model T Fords. And I always got a kick out of going by there. And there was a watering trough where the animals were watered during the day. It's very hot in Texas in the summertime. I remember particularly one time when some fellows from Texas who had been fishing in East Texas came back. And after they came back the next morning, why none of the horses would go near that trough to get a, to get a drink. Mm -hmm. No one knew why until they looked more closely and they found that they had put an alligator, about a nine-foot alligator, just an adolescent, but still an alligator, in the watering trough <laughs> for the horses and mules, just as a joke. <laughs> Another thing about that era was that the people that were the envy of their schoolmates were the ones who lived far enough away from the school that their parents provided them with a horse to ride to school. Mm -hmm. And the school provided stables for the horses to be tied up in until lunchtime when they could come out and tend to them, give them water and things like that. And then after that, well, the people who were fortunate enough to have to ride a horse to school would earn money by letting their classmates ride around the block for a nickel. And mm -hmm. that was a great thing to get a chance to ride around the block on a horse for a nickel. Mm -hmm. It's quite a change from the way things are now, I suppose. And I think it was more fun than buses. Mm -hmm. I also remember all that without any close supervision, the children organized themselves very well into appropriate age and skill groups for competition. The first, second, and third grade were on one part of the play playground, fourth and fifth on another, and the sixth and seventh on another. Mm -hmm. 
and the girls, and there's a separation between the girls and the boys, too, for play. Uh, I still remember how I learned about some of the rules of baseball. The, the kids had unofficially decided that the best way to make the game interesting would be that if a person were unskilled, like myself, starting the first grade at six, why the captain of the team would take the third strike. If the strike got, to, if, if I got two strikes on me, the captain came over, took the bat out of my hand and got ready to bat the ball, and I stood at the side of the plate ready to run if he hit it. Mm -hmm. And as a captain, he nearly always hit it. Mm -hmm. and I remember his getting the hit, and I scampered down to first base and made it. And then, embarrassment. I didn't know all the rules in baseball. The next batter hit the ball directly to the second baseman. He was standing directly between me and second base. I froze on first base, <laughs> and I learned about forced plays on the bases in the, mm -hmm. har the hard way because the whole team came running down to first base asking who was this stupid guy that didn't know that you had to run to second base if the ball was hit behind you, regardless of where the ball was hit. Mm -hmm. And so my failure to run, my embarrassment at failing to run was ingrained in me so that I never made a mistake like that again. Mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the different kinds of, um, in addition to that, what kinds of activities and sports did you play when you were kids? Well, we had an almost unlimited number of activities and it sort of went by seasons. Sometimes they would play what they call washers. They had washers the size of dollars. They dig holes a certain distance apart and they'd pitch washers to, to try to make them go in the hole. Mm -hmm. And you'd alternate from end to end. They used to call that pitching dollars because our predecessors, our adult predecessors, had used silver dollars for that game. Mm -hmm. We just used washers for it. Another game that they played was called Hully Gull. It was played with pecans. And each person would have, during the right season, everybody would carry lots of pecans in their pocket because there were a lot of them in Texas, in fact. That's the, Texas, that's the state tree of Texas. And you'd come out with a double handful of pecans between your hands. The other person would guess the number there. And if he guessed, if he guessed it right, he got all the pecans that were in your hands. Mm -hmm. If he guessed it wrong, he had to pay you the number that he had missed it, up or down. Mm -hmm. And then it'd be your turn, you'd have to guess it his. And so there are all sorts of interesting things about trying to make your hands look overly full by squeezing them between your fingers and make it look like you had a very large double handful or trying to go the other way and make it look like it's very few. And so there were all sorts of tricks in the game. And there'd be a season when you'd play Hully Gull. It'd be another, another time when you'd play with what we call tractors. You'd take a little spool like we use for thread and you'd put a tack on one end and some rubber bands, and you'd carve out a paraffin, a block that would be a lubricating block. You'd take something about the size of a pencil, run this rubber band through the hole in the spool, from the tack over through the paraffin lubricant block and around the pencil, and then you'd wind it up, put it down on the ground, and it would roll along at a slow pace. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'd put rubber bands around the spool to get better traction and you'd put your tractor down against the other fellow's tractor and see which one pushed the other one away and win something in some way. We also played marbles. We had three holes and then a distant hole that was called purgatory. <laughs> and you'd have to go through the, from first hole to second to third, and then back to second and the first, and then to second again, and then to third. And if you made it without getting hit by somebody else's marble, why, then you'd go out, go out to purgatory if you made that first why you'd, you'd win the game. It's kind of like croquet, except it was played with marbles and thumping them with your thumb instead of clubs and mm -hmm. things like that. Oh, school? What, what school was like for you? Yes. As I said, my parents had given me an early start by paying tuition for one year, and this was a burden to them because we had I had two younger brothers that were not yet in school. Our family was highly musical, lots of music all the time. My mother's a piano teacher, my father was a fine musician. And later on, as we got older, we, all, we became a center part of the musical structure there, the municipal band and so on. As for school, going in from the playground, school was strictly business. 
the teachers didn't tolerate any interruptions, and the students, knowing that they would not tolerate any, did not even offer any any interruptions. They knew that it, they were there for a purpose. Our parents were somewhat demanding on grades. They they warned us to make all A's, and we came close to it. And if they wouldn't be nasty about a B, but they always ask us, now, what kept you from making an A instead of that B? And we'd have to ask them, answer that, and so we got in the habit of trying to make all A's. Mm -hmm. As a result of, and by the way, I want to speak of my first grade teacher. She had taught three or four generations of people in first grade. Her name was Miss Walker, one of the finest teachers you'll ever find anywhere. For example, she had decks of cards which illustrated things which are now called phonics. She just called them her cards. She had perhaps a, an, a card of words that ended in A-T, like rat and mat and sat and so on. And she had flashed these cards, and we'd call out, everybody in the class, sort of in unison, would call out the word that was represented in this deck of cards in the at mm -hmm. family. And they'd be the M family and the Am family. And there were also cards for the start, starting letter, mm -hmm. C for C or T or P mm -hmm. and so on like that. And she had us thoroughly drilled in phonics long before the word phonics was even coined. Mm -hmm. And around the top of the blackboard, by the way, there were blackboards on two walls and they were used very frequently for lots of things, for dynamic teaching. Actually, a blackboard in chalk prop, under proper control and discipline can be much better than the modern magic lanterns and movies and things like that because you're doing it yourself. I like chalk and blackboard. Uh -huh. In fact, when I was quite young, I got in the habit of biting my fingernails. And, the re and my father said that he would buy me a blackboard if I would quit biting my fingernails. And he got me the blackboard and I stopped instantly. I never, mm -hmm. I never bit my fingernails after that. Mm -hmm. Around the top of the blackboard on these two walls, there were <clears throat> four rows of letters. There were the printed capital letters of the alphabet. Underneath that, a long row of the lowercase letters of the alphabet. Mm -hmm. Underneath that, the upper, the capital cursive alphabet. Mm -hmm. And below that, the lowercase or smaller letters of the cursive alphabet. Mm -hmm. And so they were one right on top of the other. So what you learned from the very outset the association between capitals, lowercase, and the two cursives. For as the day you came in, while you were staring at that, any time you looked up at the blackboard. Mm -hmm. I did well enough. One day I was asked to do a, read a special passage because the, my teacher apparently considered me the star reader. And lo and behold, when I came to one, sentence, one line in that passage, there was a word there that I either had never seen before or had never registered. Now, always remember that word because I could not figure out what it was. The word was perhaps, P-E-R-H-A-P-S, <laughs> which is a rather, which is a rather unusual word in a first grade reader. <laughs> I didn't get it. So I was stunned that she had to tell me that so I could keep reading. At any rate, I did well enough that the teacher, teacher told my parents that if they wanted to, I was in a position to skip the second grade and go directly to the third grade, even though I had just turned seven years of age. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I didn't know about this. My parents said no, they didn't think that would be advisable. They said that because they, I think they gave the right answer for the wrong reasons. They said no, if he does that, he'll miss the things he's supposed to learn in the second grade. Well, the truth of the matter is that I probably would have found some way to learn the things I was supposed to learn in the second grade, but what they did was keep me far enough back that I didn't get farther behind in a social sense, a physical sense, since I was already a year younger than my classmates. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so I went, did go into the second grade, even though I'd been offered, a, my parents had been offered a chance to let me skip the second mm -hmm. grade. Mm -hmm. I did well in the second grade, and my teacher, I still remember her too, her name was Miss Carpenter, and she was a very fine teacher. All of our teachers in those days were very fine because that was one of the few professions in which ladies were welcome. And so we got the cream of the crop. We got the best, the most intelligent uh, ladies in the land as school teachers. Mm -hmm. I was a beneficiary of that in my generation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I was pretty fast in arithmetic especially. And one day the class said that they said they thought they could, I could beat the teacher in putting down the multiplication table. 
we were just getting started at that time on the twos. And so the teacher agreed to a race. Now, I don't know whether she slowed down to give me a good chance or not, but I know that I used a different system than she did, even in the second grade when I was just seven years old. <clears throat> Her method of writing down the multiplication table runs like this. One times two equals two. Two times two equals four. Three times two equals six, and so on, up to the point where it says 12 times two equals 24. We always carried them out to 12. Mm -hmm. And my method, which I had already adopted on my, on my own initiative, the initiative was to write down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Time, 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 time. 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 12 times. Equal, 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 12 times. And then I wrote down 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. Mm -hmm. And I beat her. <laughs> the class here. <laughs> now, she might have slowed down, but I did use a method which I think indicated that even at age seven, I was thinking a little bit about efficient production methods. I uh -huh. it did work, and I did win. It was mathematics your best subject? <laughs> even yes. Even early on? Uh, I have been strong in a number of subjects, including grammar and English and things like that. But the one, <laughs> and science of all kinds, but the one that I've always been the strongest in has been mathematics, or its predecessors, mm -hmm. arithmetic. In school, as a person who was lucky enough to be blessed with a good, good mental powers, and being young, tended to make me a little bit shy because I was behind physically. I mentioned about not taking the force from first to second when all the other boys uh, a year or so older knew that, and I didn't. <coughs> and <coughs> so I guess I was on the shy side. I always got along with the teachers perfectly. Mm -hmm. And with the students, I got along reasonably well. There were no serious conflicts. I remember one time when I probably was ungenerous and something unusual happened. There's a fellow that was two or three years older than I and on the ground, and we were eating our lunch. And my father always put in a nice lunch for me, including banana. I had a nice banana that I peeled and started to eat. And this fellow, who was much, much larger than I, he was about a sixth grader, came over and uh, I think his name was Soggy. And he said, may I have a bite of your banana? I said, no. And he leaned over and took about a three inch bite off the top of my banana. <laughs> I didn't like that. I couldn't do anything about it. But apparently I was being a little bit ungenerous at that time and he decided to help me learn how to be more generous. Very nice so of things, you. things like that happen fairly often. Uh -huh. But it, on the whole, it was a rather a very calm and well-behaved school now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they did use corporal punishment occasionally, mm -hmm. but the, the knowledge that corporal punishment could be used meant that it hardly ever had to be used, and the behavior was very good. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> By the way, in my own family, it was well known that if you got corporal punishment at school, you'd get corporal punishment again at home for having misbehaved at school. Mm -hmm. And so even if you got corporal punishment at school, the kids that got it were careful to keep it from their parents when they went home. <laughs> Would that mean getting hit by a switch or getting spanked? Or? Spanked on the, re on the rear where you sit down mm -hmm. with a paddle, a small paddle or a leather belt or a little green limber switch off of a tree. Mm -hmm. And we did not regard this with animosity, we regarded with, if we had done something that was wrong and got corporal punishment, we figured that was just the part of the part of the game. It, you knew it when you did it, that it could happen, and it did happen, and you did not bear any personal resentment against your parents for getting cor corporal punishment, nor at school from getting it from a teacher. You might be a little bit angry for half an hour or so, but then settle down and you knew that you had brought it on yourself by disobeying the rules. Mm -hmm. The main rule that was that caused us to get corporal punished would be failure to get home very quickly after school. At the time, we thought they were unreasonable on this because it did not give us time to play with our playmates on the way home from school. Mm -hmm. However, as I see what can happen to young kids at the hands of uh, criminally oriented adults, I can understand why our parents were very uneasy every time 
we were as much as a half an hour or an hour late in getting mm -hmm. home from anywhere. Mm -hmm. I did not understand it then, but I thoroughly understand it now. Mm -hmm. If we went on to the upper grade, why, <clears throat> I remember that we changed to a system in which instead of having the same teacher all year, we had the same teacher throughout the third grade. But then when we got up into the higher grades, each teacher specialized in one or two subjects. Miss Dillard specialized in geography and artwork and drawing. Uh, Miss Jones specialized in spelling as well as arithmetic. Uh, the person that taught history also handled literature or English mm -hmm. and so on. I'm trying to remember what the uh, fourth teacher handled, but I oh, English was also paired in some cases with spelling. We got to the fifth grade and had a very fine teacher who happened to also be the male coach of the athletic teams for the grammar school. And he was very energetic. And he started teaching us all the parts of speech, their uses, sentence structures, how to diagram sentences, how each part of speech was used in various parts of the sentences, not just simple sentences, but compound sentences, complex sentences, prepositional phrases, the entire works. And we learned it very thoroughly. And we were, most of us, by the way, it, in a small town like that, your classmates are about the same from the first grade through the 11th, unless somebody fails. Mm -hmm. Sometimes someone would fail, and if you failed in any one subject, you retained for a year to repeat that subject, even though you might have done well in the others. Mm -hmm. But And there were occasional failures. And <clears throat> he taught us English so thoroughly that when we went to the sixth grade, and another, they, he left and went to some other school, but we got another male athletic coach in the grammar school for the sixth grade, and he was teaching English also. And he started to t start to teach us say about now and say we've already had that. Start teach us about verbs. We had that last year. Uh, mm -hmm. And then get into sentence structure. Say, well, this is a preposition phrase. Yes, we know that. We had that last year. Mm -hmm. We ended up. He couldn't understand what in the world had happened because everything he was supposed to teach in the sixth mm -hmm. grade had already been taught to us in the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. And so most of us went on to the seventh grade. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask you, it sounds like you really loved school a lot and uh, had a really positive memory of it. It was a positive memory at the time. And what is happening nowadays to our schools reinforces my knowledge of the fact that I was privileged to have been at that kind of school and with that group of teachers more so than any other generation that I know of. Mm -hmm. It was a very lucky time to be born. Mm -hmm. It was, it became the early part of the most exciting century in all history also, but more of that later. Mm -hmm. Went on, oh, I forgot to mention one thing back in the, in the second grade. Mm -hmm. You represented your school in spelling at the county level and to my astonishment, they asked me to be one of the two representatives of the school when I was still in the second grade at the county level, and that included grades one through four. Mm -hmm. Well, I studied hard and learned all the things that they were going to draw the words from. They were, I still remember that one of the words I had to learn to spell was Mediterranean because I had to work on that because I couldn't remember the, all of the vowels properly. To this day, I guess, I'd have to think twice to spell Mediterranean correctly because that next to the last A sometimes can get, you can get a T-E erroneously substituted for it. Mm -hmm. I did at that time, but I, when I think about it now, I can remember how to spell it properly. Going to the seventh grade, my math teacher was Miss Jones. And I remember that one of the toughest kind of problems they had then, this was still in arithmetic. We had already learned add, subtract, multiply, divide, long division, all that stuff, remainders. And in, to make use of our arithmetic, they uh, used what they call partial payment problems. And that meant that someone bought an article and paid a certain amount down, and they were supposed to pay so much per month, and, and plus interest, simple interest, mm -hmm. every month. And so they didn't make it easy and say, you're supposed to pay this at 50 a month until you pay it all. They would say, the article is $850 and a down payment of $150. And then 
30 days later, he'd come in and pay $75. The next month, he'd pay $130. The next month, maybe $175 again. And keep on like that. And finally, it'd get down to the point where it was nearly all paid out. And the question was to figure out how much was the last payment after you. The earlier payments had been applied first to interest and then to principal, mm -hmm. to interest and principal. So you had an awful lot of multiplying and so on. And finally, at the end, you had to figure out how much left and was left and had to be paid. Mm -hmm. And so we had fairly complex arithmetic problems in the seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, most of us finished. Along the way, by the way, we picked up some very interesting classmates that helped us out later in athletics because they had failed one or more subjects. It was not a disgrace to fail in one subject. And what it did was give them a one-year age advantage for later on when they were going to be playing athletics events in mm -hmm. high school. Mm -hmm. And in that way, I picked up my best lifetime friend, E.B. Ware of Bartlett, Texas. He's still down there, and he's still one of the best friends I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. Later on, he married the beauty queen of the high school, and they have some children and grandchildren, and it's always a privilege to go back down there and visit with E.B. Ware. Mm -hmm. <coughs> He still lives in Bartlett? Yes. He's been there all his life? Yes. Hmm. Well, he was in he was in the Air Force during World War II. Uh -huh. While I was in the Navy, he was in the Air Force in the European Theater, I believe. Theater, I, believe. I was in the Pacific Theater, so I didn't see him at all during the war. Mm -hmm. The Cagle family, a very fine family there. Their father was a fine referee and umpire, unquestioned ethical judgment. Out-of-town team could never question his call in any athletic event, and he had very fine sons. And I, I regret to say that of his four sons, two were killed in action in World War II. Mm. So there was some sadness that came much later, though. When we got into high school, why, we had had some algebra in the seventh grade, but we got algebra one in high school, and they made it made it very businesslike getting into logarithms, and we didn't get into trigonometric functions then. We got into logarithms and anti-logarithms. And then the next year we had, oh, we had algebra two. We went into more algebra, mm -hmm. in which you had to solve quadratic equations and some other things that were somewhat more difficult. Mm -hmm. and, the, and then after algebra one and algebra two, we got into plane geometry. And I excelled in this. I remember by that time I had gone out for the football team, even though at that time I was five feet 11 inches tall and weighed 130 pounds. Mm -hmm. And I was by far the youngest and smallest on the team. E.B. Ware was on the team and he was a star. He was about a year or a year and a half younger than I was and a natural athlete. He, he was could, younger or older? A year and a half old. I, older. Okay. I said that wrong, I guess. He was a year, I was a year and a half younger than he was. He was he was a very able fellow for any age, and he had a year and a half advantage on me that way. Mm -hmm. So, it, I know that when when we practiced, we only had a squad of 18, which meant, and that was in the days of 60-minute football. The best 11 athletes stayed on for offense and for defense. And so, those of us, the other seven of us who were on the squad, didn't get a lot of action on game days but we got lots of action Monday through Thursday getting ready for a Friday game because we were the live dummies that the other 11 <laughs> practiced against. <laughs> now, some of the fellows hit as hard as they could, but I always remember that E.B., despite his very great athletic ability, would take it easy on us when he'd come through in a blocking assignment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I respected him for that, among other things, because he was quite capable of knocking anybody down if he wanted to. Uh -huh. So it was a it was a nice it was a nice period of my life going to school. Mm -hmm. By the way, my there was no Medicare or hospitalization or medi any kind of medical insurance, and so my parents had forbade me to go out for football. So I went out secretly. But after they found out that I had gone out, why they ended up getting me a good pair of football shoes and supporting me in it, and they and just. I had I had told them that I had found from contact, body contact, 
that the human body is a lot stronger than they thought it was, and you can get knocked very hard and still jump up without any serious injury. Mm -hmm. And so they accepted that, and I, I, I played as a substitute for my last two years in high school, the 10th grade and the 11th grade. Mm -hmm. And it was a very beneficial experience, too. It showed me that despite small size and light weight, you still could do something. And occasionally I did get into games when there was an emergency, when one of the first trainers would make a serious mistake, like failing to cover a hide, a, a, an opponent who was hiding out close to the sideline where he wouldn't be noticed. Mm -hmm. The coach just told me, he said, if that ever happens and they don't notice it, you just go in and put yourself in as a substitute. In those days, you had to report to the referee to substitute, and so on one occasion I had to put myself in as a substitute because the star end had failed to notice a fellow lying down on the grass close to the sideline and not noticed by the star end. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I got to take his place for a few plays. <clears throat> it was tough in, those, tough in those days, though, because if a man were taken out, he could not go back in that same quarter. He could only go back into, onto the field after a change of quarters. I also remember a game which was a little bit unusual. It was a, about a 95-yard punt. The wind was blowing in our back. It was a Texas norther in our backs, and we had been trapped about the two yard, our own two-yard line. And so in those days, we made more use of quick kicks than they do nowadays. A quick kick is one where a person who is in the running position, instead of running, punts the ball. Mm -hmm. If the wind was at his back, and I believe that a fellow named Hemphill received, in those days, the ball went directly to the runner, not to the quarterback to be handed off somewhere like they do now. We didn't lose that time. The centers were much more accurate in those days than they are now, even at the professional level. And they not only would pass it to the person that was going to carry the ball, they'd lead him a foot or two so that he could be running as the ball was in the air. And so our center our position was much more sophisticated in those days than it is now. Mm -hmm. And so the ball was passed back, since we were on the two-yard line, was passed back to Hemphill to quick kick, and he quick kicked it over everybody because the other team was expecting us to run. They were going to try to trap us in the goal end zone. And the ball rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled across the far goal line. <laughs> uh -huh. Of course, that meant they got it on the 20, but it's quite different from our having it on the two. I'll never forget that play. In another case, again, I didn't play much, but I got to see this, and I played a little bit. The county schools were divided into A category and B category, and we were small. We had a population of about 2,000. We were a B category. The county seat, Georgetown, was in the A court category with a population of about 20,000. And they had won the A championship and wanted to play us in a postseason game since they'd won the A championship and we had won the B championship. They wanted to show us the difference between A's and B's. Well, they came to town and my, my friend, E.B., got the ball and ran for a touchdown. <laughs> Hemp Hill got the ball and ran for a touchdown. We were not skilled on place kicking. We didn't get the extra point in either case. And then E.B. got the ball a third, uh, another time and ran for a third touchdown. The game ended with the Class B champions winning 18 to nothing over the Class A champions. Wow. And we never forgot that. Wow. While this was going on, why our family was getting more deeply involved in music. Our parents were already deeply involved. Very fine musician. My mother could play everything from a clarinet to a pipe organ, including pianos and accordions and trumpets and other things in between. Mm. My father was talented on stringed instruments like guitar as well, and mandolins and banjos, as well as he played mostly, though, the baritone, the brass instrument. Mm. And so we had, we had no TV, of course, and we didn't even have a radio most of the time because we didn't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. The Depression in Texas didn't start in 1929. The Depression in Texas and most of the Southwest started in 1921 hmm. when World War I ended. The demand for cotton ended because of the end of World War I, and the price plummeted from 40 or 45 cents a pound down to 10 cents a pound or less. Hmm. And so there was no money in the area. So around when you were about five, it started. 
What about five then? I, my school career coincided with the beginnings of the Depression mm -hmm. in the southwestern part of the country. I see. And so we didn't know anything except hard times. We didn't know, we didn't regard ourselves as being disadvantaged or poor or needing outside help because nearly all the other people were in the same boat. Mm -hmm. And so we just took it and lived with it. Uh -huh. <clears throat> For example, I mentioned we didn't have any medical insurance, but the doctors in effect gave us de facto insurance because they wouldn't charge you more than you could pay. Mm. And an office visit might cost 50 cents or a dollar or something like that. And they made calls too, under terrible circumstances. Before I got came along during the great influenza epidemic, which killed so many people throughout the world, <clears throat> our family doctors, there were three fine doctors in town. Our doctor was Dr. Harlan. And those doctors would travel by horseback or buggy in terrible weather to attend to patients who were five or six miles out of town and the doctors themselves would be traveling while they were suffering the same way. They might mm -hmm. be having influenza while they were trying to treat patients for influenza. Well. And they were just wonderful people. They were, mm -hmm. they were in a category all their own. Just like mm -hmm. my school, I feel privileged to have had the school teachers I had. I was privileged to have had the medical attention, uh, the medical profession of that era. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I remember later on when I was going in the Navy and was calling attention to large scars and the fact that my right leg was not as strong as my left leg, mm -hmm. why I had, oh, I had never been able to outrun my, my middle brother and I'd always wondered why until I realized my right leg was not as strong as his right leg. And I was describing this to the naval physician who was admitting me into the Navy for World War II. And I gave him this, these facts. And when he got through listening to me, he said, well, you said you were 18 months and had a fractured right femur? I said, yes, sir. And he said, and that leg is the same length as the other leg? Yes, sir. And it's fully usable? He said, you, you are the beneficiary of a miracle. Mm. He said that, he said, and I realized then that considering the fact that I was 18 months old and they had to adopt new technology, swinging, they first packed it in sandbags that didn't work. They tried plates on the bones. They finally swung it from the ceiling and mm. that worked. Mm. And he said, you're the beneficiary of a miracle. Mm. At that point, I realized that there is somewhere in the medical literature, they showed me later, a picture of what I looked like with a leg tied to the ceiling. It was a new technology for handling fractured limbs in small children. Hmm. <coughs> so... A little break for a while because I had to stop and put Annika to bed. So, um, by the way, we're in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. We're on a little family vacation, family get-together here. We're sitting out on the porch here in the house on Virginia Avenue. Um, anyway, so... I guess we'll start talking again more about your family, right? Yes. Okay. I think you were talking a little bit about your parents. Yes. Uh, you were mentioning about how musical they were. My parents were highly musical, and even though they had not had an advanced education, they, were the, they came from people who had had more education before they came to Texas. Any group of people that settled in a new country, as Texas was back 100 years ago, they really give up a couple of generations because it takes a while before you can reestablish the institutions that they had left behind. Some of my great-grandparents were quite versatile in, in Greek and Latin. They could read things in their original form. But they, on my mother's side, most of them took a sailboat around Florida and settled on the southeast coast of Texas. Where did so they far. come from when, uh, in they, the sailboat? They had come from Scotland and then to North Carolina very early before the Revolutionary War and then when Texas became available for colonization while they still part of Mexico, they sailed around Florida in a sailboat and settled on the coast of Texas and they lived down there for a while. This was your mother's, and my mother's, mother's side. ancestors. And they participated in the Texas Revolution against, against Mexico Independence was declared on March 2nd, 1936. And a great uncle was in the troops at the Alamo who were exterminated by the Mexicans under Travis. 
And Can I add, clarify something? You said independence was declared which year? March 2nd, 1936. I mean, 1836. Okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> and so, that was on my mother's side. They were highly musical and highly educated. And even though my parents did not get to go to college, they came from the kind of people who normally would go to college if they stayed back in their former country. But <clears throat> and my father's folks came down from, from the north also, and they were talented not only in music, but they were regarded as highly educated because they were ministers. In those days, religion was a very big thing, and they were very good at, at church work and that sort of thing. This was, uh, which census, are you talking my about his, his parents or his... His parents. They were ministers? Yes, yeah, and they, ministers. Where, where did they come from? Do they came from area? the Ohio and Indiana region, and they came down to Texas uh, by land. Uh-huh. Do you and know when they came around, roughly when they might have come down? It was in the, it was in the late 1800s. Uh-huh. For example, when they, when they got as far as Round Rock, Texas, where Sam Bass held forth. He was a, one of these wild westerners, a gunner. So the people begged him to stay there and be the minister there instead of going anywhere else. But they ended up going somewhere else anyway. So I had, we had a tradition of higher education and lots of music and the arts on both sides of the family. Mm -hmm. My father and his brothers were all very good athletes. Uh, my father's older brother could run a hundred yards in ten seconds when that was close to the world record. Hmm. <clears throat> and another one could take bridge spikes and bend them with his bare hands. These are the large nails you used to make timber type bridges hmm. in those days. So they were all very athletic and very musical. Later on, why two of my uncles on my father's side served in world two or three of them served in World War One. One of them was badly gassed and lost most of his eyesight and had to play by ear for the rest of his life. He played mm -hmm. trombone. Mm -hmm. So the family, we were trapped by low income during the Depression because of the Depression that began in 1921 in Southwest because of the mm -hmm. depressed agricultural prices. So, but in spite of the low income, my father was working for a large grocery store. He later formed a grocery store of his own, a smaller one, mm -hmm. and did better at that. But during the early part of that, when security was paramount, he held on to his job with a big grocery store, and the income was significantly less than $20 per week mm -hmm. on that side. However, my mother taught music, and the rest of us taught music too, taught wind instruments. My mother taught everything from pipe organ to wind instruments and with the piano and accordion all in between. Her mm -hmm. primary instrument was piano, mm -hmm. and we were the mainstay of the musical department of our church, which was the... Christian Church, which is a Protestant denomination, a rather conservative Protestant denomination mm. in the South. It was not like the... It was called the Christian Church? That was the name of it. I see. And it was, some people call the same denomination in the North, Disciples of Christ. But, uh, and there was another one that was similar to ours, but did not believe in instrumental music. That was called Church of Christ. Mm. Uh, ours was a moderate type Protestant religion. And we were the mainstay of the music department in that uh, in that church, playing our instruments and singing and things like that. Mm -hmm. We also formed the nucleus of the municipal band in Barker, Texas. So as a family, you formed the core uh, musical group, both in the church and in the municipal band. Yes, there was no music in the public school system. And so we really were the musical center of our small community. Mm -hmm. We also were the center for outlying districts where they might have smaller communities of 300 to 500 people. And we would sometimes go out and they, they were so interested in getting help with music in these outlying communities that they would give us free access to their public school during the summertime. And my brothers and mother and I, we'd drive over in one car, my father was working, and we'd spread out in, in the school and give lessons in each of the classrooms that, that we occupied, and then after a week or two, we'd bring them back in and let them play some simple tune together, and they were so amazed that on wind instruments, they could reach the point where they could play a simple mm -hmm. tune together, that they were thrilled beyond measure. How and old were you when you were helping your mother well, teach? 
At that time, I had gotten into college, but uh -huh. I'd do this during the summer when I'd come home. I see. But Billy and Carter, my younger brothers, did it some before then, when I was still tied up in college. Uh-huh. So it was an active family, and I, I remember that the instruments we bought, we could not afford. I played piano for a long time, and when I was about 14 or 15, well, we got enough money we could buy a, corn, a trumpet for about $18, and that's how I finally got started on wind instruments. And that really saved my musical career because I was not capable of reading all of the notes on a piano score in parallel as my mother did. Hmm. And I needed to have an instrument in which I read just one row of notes at a time. Uh -huh. And that's how I became switched over to wind instruments. And my brothers did the same thing. Billy took up trombone, and, I, and Carter started on E-flat alto horn, and I taught him on E-flat alto horn. Later on, he became very proficient on clarinet as well as and trumpet as well. While this was going on, why, I also was very active in scouting. I never did make Eagle because after making Star, Life, Scout and, Life Scout and Star Scout, why, <coughs> the school teacher who was our scoutmaster moved to a different town and I didn't have anybody to give me the Eagle test. But in the course of scouting activities, I had a number of very interesting uh, accomplishments. Each summer we would go to a camp for about two weeks. And I had already become interested in archery, and at the scout camp, I made very, very fine bows, <coughs> arrows, and became proficient in archery. They also, of course, made us excellent in swimming, life-saving, and it would be rare nowadays, but we, we practiced marksmanship every single day mm -hmm. if we wanted to. And mm -hmm. I, I always made the high score except one day they decided to exclude me so someone else would have a chance and a boy from our troop in Bartlett, Texas won the, won the high score that particular day. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and, I, and I thoroughly enjoyed what we were doing in the scout camps. They made very good swimmers out of us and taught us first aid and life-saving and all that sort of thing and to this day I'm more proficient than later generations because I guess they got hooked on other activities mm -hmm. that were a little bit less down to earth. Mm -hmm. I was a patrol leader and I had EB as he was older than I but I had been nominated as a patrol leader and EB was in my patrol and he had a number of other friends who had played football and mm -hmm. came in and they came into my patrol and we had a very fine patrol and when we'd have I remember we had a game that's called a string game in which each person had a piece of ordinary twine, not strong twine, just the kind you could break easily, mm -hmm. around his one thigh. And this was his life. When that string was broken, well, he was dead. And our patrol could always win on that because we always, we always could hoist the other people up over our heads to someone behind to break his string and <laughs> use tactics that were pretty, pretty formidable to win the string game. We also played a game called Capture the Flag, in which a flag is hidden somewhere on your territory. You couldn't conceal it under brush, but it had to be open to the top, but it could be in an area where it'd be hard to find it just because of the light. And at night, we'd have a line, and you were trying to capture the other party's flag, and if you were captured, you went into a jail and had to stay there until someone bailed you out, and in the process of bailing you out, they might get caught too. Mm -hmm. So if you captured all the people on the other side or captured their flag, you won the game. I remember we did this in a pasture area one time through which a creek ran, and the creek had bluffs on it. And we were chasing one fellow on the other team who had gotten trapped, nearly trapped on our side, and we were running in full speed, and we knew which direction he was running, and he was very dark, the moon wasn't out. He didn't realize what he was doing, and we heard a giant yell. He'd gone off the bluff oh, and landed in the creek. <laughs> We stood on the edge of the bluff and laughed at him. <laughs> we did something else which was dangerous. We had sword fights in which if you could touch the person anywhere on the trunk. We did not include the head because we didn't want anyone to be deliberately trying to poke up close to the eyes. But if a person were touched anywhere with the tip of your limb, which was a, regarded as a sword, it was not real stiff, it was off of a tree, so it would, would bend. You touched him while he was dead, and the person that the one that decided that had live people after it was all over with, 
would be the one that won the contest. It would, if I were doing that now, I would insist on putting a tennis ball on the end of each one of those synthetic sabers to make them more safe. But with that, with that provision, it would be an interesting game, especially if people wore masks to protect their faces. Mm. It, it could be made a game as interesting as the one that they pay many dollars for now to fight simulated combat with guns that fire dye pellets, red pellets. Uh -huh. We had another game that was like that too, which we call rubber guns. We cut large rubber bands off of inner tubes and we developed pistols, rifles, and machine guns with notches on top and a string so it could fire single shots, a small burst or a large burst, and each person was started out with five lives and if he got hit five times on the trunk, why, he was dead. And usually he would be a winner in the next game then because while everyone else was finishing that game, he'd be walking around picking up rubber bands and he'd have more ammunition than anybody else in the next game. And this was maybe when you were in high school? Yes, and we and peop some people laughed at us for continuing to play games like that when we were in high school. Uh -huh. They thought we were too juvenile, but, uh, that we should be doing things more mature than that. But it was so much fun, we couldn't give it up. Uh -huh. uh, there was a large tree in the front of my house, and being a scout, I knew Morse code, and sometimes I'd climb this tree. E.B.'s house was about uh, a quarter of a mile away, and I'd start sending Morse code to him. He'd hear it come out. How would you send Morse code? On a bugle. Oh, I Climb can't. the tree with a bugle and send dots and dashes <laughs> with a bugle, talk to him on the bugle, and he'd end up with his brother coming over and joining us to play a battle <laughs> with rubber guns. A kid's game like that. But now, adults in their 20s, 30s, and 40s play games like that because it is so much fun. <laughs> we discovered that fun much a long time before it was discovered. In fact, we discovered it about 65 or 70 years before it became apparent mm -hmm. to people around here that that is a lot of fun. Who pokes fun at you, adults, or uh, was it other kids? It's mostly the other high school students. They didn't really yeah. poke much fun. They just look aside. They couldn't believe that we were doing things like that. I just want to ask you another question about it. What were the girls do from around there? What were they doing all this time? Was it just boys playing these games? And what were the girls? Just boys playing that yeah. game. We also had rather massive water fights too, in which we used various. You can make a pretty good water pistol out of a piece of Georgia cane. That's the cane that you use for making long fishing poles. Uh -huh. And each joint is, ho is hollow. And if you cut the right size hole in one of the in one of the end pieces, and make a swab out of cotton cloth and string around a stick, you can make a squirt gun that'll shoot very hard for mm -hmm. about 30 feet or so. We had very good water fights as well. We had lots of combat-oriented things, but they were under control. Not like now, when they're using real ammunition to try to kill each other. We use them for fun, and we had lots of fun with them. What were the girls doing while you were plant doing all this stuff? Do you know? You know, in those days, many boys didn't, didn't know the girls, and they didn't keep very much track of what they were doing. The girls were majoring in, a lot of them were majoring in home economics and preparing for family life. They became good cooks and things like that. A lot of the boys were majoring in agriculture to become farmers. Mm -hmm. And it was a rural area, a lot of rural orientation. And I guess the girls were mostly making clothing, trying on clothing. And later on, as cars came in, well, they'd sometimes go for rides with their boyfriend although that was not as prevalent as it is now. Uh-huh. I see. They went to the movies. On Saturday night, the whole family could go into the movie for 50 cents. And so the families would go to movies, and other nights, well, the girls probably went with boys, but I just didn't know about it. I never had a date in high school, so I didn't know much about I what see. the girls did. Uh-huh. All right, what, um, what else happened during your high school years? Well, fortunately, I elected to take <coughs> typing as an elective, and I, I scored high for that area. At that time, I had the record for what could be done in the first course in typing. I got 59 words a minute, and that's been a benefit to me throughout my life, to be able to use a keyboard successfully. Our parents forbade, not only did they forbade, forbid me to play football, they also said you can't 
go down to the creek unless you have someone with you. But we didn't own a car. And so it was a, it was a <coughs> walk, a knock. We couldn't learn to swim because we couldn't go to the creek. We couldn't go to the creek because we didn't have a car. And so there's a cornfield close to our house. And so I'd sneak off through the cornfield and slip down to the creek and practice swimming. We also practiced lying on, resting our stomachs on a piano stool so we could practice all the strokes from diagrams we had. Mm -hmm. Breast stroke, side stroke, crawl, everything like that. Uh -huh. By balancing on our abdomen, while we practiced them in thin air. And then now, your family must have been sort of unusual that way, right? I mean, how many families would have used a diagram to practice <laughs> swimming strokes? Well, I guess in, in many respects our family was unusual, quite uh -huh. unusual. We built things that other people couldn't build. We studied the canoes, and we saw that the northern canoes had bent ribs that went across, went crossways. We couldn't. We tried to make a steam box that would make wood soft enough to bend like that, but without pressure, you can't get a high enough temperature to do that. So we had to redesign canoes, and so we figured out, and to get economical materials, we figured out how to make a canoe out of Georgia cane, running the Georgia cane fishing pole style. Uh, mm -hmm ribs longitudinally instead of transverse and so we made canoes with a frame like that with light lumber crossways and the long georgia cane poles the other way then mm -hmm. we covered it with canvas and we waterproofed it with this was with heavy duty canvas like they made cotton sacks from mm -hmm. and then we made it waterproof by and this sounds a little dangerous we make melted paraffin with gasoline mm -hmm. as a solvent and we painted it with this mixture of gasoline and paraffin. The gasoline of course evaporated and left the paraffin in soaked all the way through the canvas and so it was waterproof. Mm -hmm. uh, my father had been a very good baseball player and in those days why they had teams for churches and for businesses and there's a lot of fun around the town, community fun. It's fun to go out and see your own parents play a baseball game. And everybody back to the local high school team when they when they were playing in a, an opponent. It was more fun than TV. In many respects, radio and TV have lifted, lifted that out of the hands of the rural communities, and we have lost a great deal because of this. Mm. Destroying the rural communities mm -hmm. of the nation has been has caused a weakening of the cohesion and cooperativeness mm -hmm. of the American typical American community. Mm -hmm. In Europe, America has been known for its community type cooperative activities and volunteer activities, mm -hmm. and that's diminishing now. And our our <coughs> culture is the worse off because of this happening. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I went, I had, the first time I had a test, uh, and what's, I guess, supposed to be IQ, why they made a special event in Texas, in Bartlett, Texas, and got these forms for every student in all the grades and all the teachers to take this test at the same time on a given day. And they passed them out, timed everyone, cut, cut them off at a certain time. And I finished it in time pretty easily. In fact, I had time to go over my paper a second time. I, and they were supposed to keep these grades confidential. But they made, somebody made a report to the school board of what had happened. And the word got from the school board back to my father, and he was very proud of the fact that the report was that I'd made the highest grade in the whole system. Mm. And uh, <laughs> I never did see the paper myself. I just had to go <coughs> the school board to my father to that effect. <coughs> So my younger brothers were coming along, and they were doing very well in school, too. And, and <clears throat> so uh, while we were very low in income and no one knew how it could be done, there was never any question but what we were going to go to college. Mm -hmm. It was understood that because of the economy of the state colleges in Texas, and at that time, tuition was $12.50 per semester not per semester hour, per semester, mm -hmm. $25 total for the whole school year. Mm -hmm. And th there was never any question but what we were going to work our way through school one way or another, with the help from our parents, especially from our mother who was continued to teach school, I mean teach music, while our father was 
providing the necessities of life from his newly formed small grocery store. By the way, we had very good diet throughout this whole period, despite the depression, because we had lots of vegetables and fruits and things like that. Uh huh. <coughs> did you eat? Uh, did, what kind of protein did you get? Well, we had. We usually had steak once a week on Sundays, uh -huh. and I didn't care much for meat, but I liked the gravy. My mother made very good biscuits. I guess I'm primarily a carbohydrate man. I eat more carbohydrates than any other form of food. Uh -huh. I haven't been heavy on protein any time in my life. Uh -huh. uh, there were a couple of incidents that were a little bit unfavorable during the high school career, but I handled them okay. Our star end, who was named Marvin Thompson, and <coughs> He was really a star, a very fine end, catch the ball if it came anywhere close to him. Well, I was just a substitute in, and after practice one day during the week, why, I was taking my shower and I got through and went over to put my clothes on, I found that my prize belt buckle, a leather, a leather belt with a sterling silver buckle was missing. Mm -hmm. I looked over and Marvin Thompson had it on. I, I told him, I said, that's my belt. He said, no, I'm going to take it. And I knew that he had recently had a boxing match in which he got his nose broken, and it had been very painful for him. I said, well, you're bigger than I am, and you probably can lick me, but I said, while you're licking me, I'm going to break your nose again. And he <laughs> thought about that a minute, and he stripped the belt out of his pants and handed it over to me, <laughs> even though he was quite a bit bigger and older and stronger than I was. <laughs> the other episode occurred in the basement when a ring of boys older than I was and young and stronger than I was. The boys' room was down in the basement and they formed a semicircle around me with my back against the wall and they stand there staring at me, not saying anything. And I was very naive then. I didn't know about the kinds of mistreatment that were possible, but I just knew that things could be done that were bad. And I was looking them right in the eye and they were looking at me. And I said, before they said anything, I looked him in the eye and I said, well, there's so many of you and you're so big, I guess I can't prevent whatever you think you're going to do. But everybody, but I said, as soon as I get out of here, I'll take care of each and every one of you. And my reputation as the top marksman in the area, I never missed a target. I always made the highest score in every marksmanship test. It was such that they didn't say anything, they just broke and filed up the stairs and went back upstairs and I walked out without any problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But by great good luck, the former superintendent of our schools became the dean of men at the University of Texas. Mm -hmm. And a man who was, uh, and a young man who was a little older than I, Arno Nowotny, the former superintendent was V.I. Moore, Arno Nowotny had been valedictorian of a class, and he had become the assistant dean of men at the University of Texas. Mm. This is one reason for our optimism about being able to get an education. Mm. But the first thing that broke for me was an opportunity to run a bicycle shop and do certain other work, janitorial type work, at Stephenville, Texas at Tarleton College opened up because of an uncle of mine who was running this bicycle, owned this bicycle shop, and they provided me free room as well. So I went to Stephenville and went to Tarleton. At Tarleton, it's a military school. They're all in uniforms. They, even the girls were, wore uniforms. And this tended to make everything democratic. You couldn't have some people flaunting fine clothes in front of others. And so it put everyone on an even basis. And we had dances about every two or three weeks in this gymnasium. And so it was a very interesting leveling type experience to have the social activities under the control of the school and mm -hmm. on the campus so that they behaved well and everyone had a chance to do various things uh -huh. together. I enjoyed it. And that's, that's when I learned to dance and that's when I had my first date when I was a freshman in a junior college. Uh -huh. I did well. I was in the band, but I did well in military science on weapons and <coughs> learned the, handle the formations well and things like that and knew all the characteristics of the weapons including rifles, Browning automatic rifles, machine guns, mortars 
and did well enough that to my surprise, I got a notice in the mail during the summer that I had been selected as first major of the cadet corps. Mm -hmm. Now, there was another fellow who was one notch above me, and he, <coughs> his name was MacField McDaniel from Brownwood, Texas. He had been, he had gone there in his high school years as well as in his first college year, and he, he was senior to me. But this appointment as first major automatically made me co-proctor with my friend, my superior, Matthew McDaniel, of one of the dormitories there. And that carried free room and board. Wow. And so I, it was a major financial benefit mm -hmm. and also gave me some prestige on the campus. Wow. After a short time, I promoted to lieutenant colonel and still the second in rank because he was promoted from lieutenant colonel to colonel. We were very, we were very agreeable. He's a very fine friend. And <clears throat> I think he became a medical doctor. His name was MacField McDaniel from Brownwood, Texas. Mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> life began on a happy note. Because of the depression which still prevailed, I took what was called a terminal course in business administration, which included everything you needed to do accounting and all the things associated with running a business. And, but I also on the side took all the math I could and also physics and other things like that because I knew that my primary interests were in science. Mm -hmm. I took the, the business thing so that I would be prepared for versatility in case mm -hmm. the continuation of the, de of the depression. Mm -hmm. I even also took all the education courses and psychology courses I needed to qualify as a public school teacher in the state of Texas in case it got to the point where I needed mm -hmm. to teach in, high, in a high school or a grammar school. Mm -hmm. But the between my sophomore and junior year, though, it's I made the University of Texas now. To the, uh, to the, uh, uh -huh. From Tarleton to the University of Texas, I made that transition between junior and senior years, and went down and had when I walked in and introduced myself to V.I. Moore, the former superintendent of the schools at University uh, Bartlett. Uh -huh. Why he said, "Well, yeah, we'll help you get jobs and everything like that," and he did so. Mm. And <clears throat> At first, I had to do a lot of dishwashing at a college-run restaurant, and I had to do other things for, I uh, did something else for <coughs> cash. I tutored for cash. I could tutor the people in my own classes because I'd usually get ahead of the other students, and so I tutored them and made what was then a very handsome amount of a dollar per hour for a single per single student, mm -hmm. dollar and a half for two, uh, for two, and mm -hmm. two dollars an hour for three. Yeah. And so I could clean up, especially when tests and exams were coming along. <laughs> I also played in the Longhorn Band and traveled with. I wasn't big enough to play football or other athletics, but I became a trumpet player in the Longhorn Band and traveled with the band to most of their away football games. Had a lot of fun at that. Mm -hmm. And because of being in the Longhorn Band, I was also selected to be a part of the Texas Centennial Exposition Band in 1936, when Texas celebrated its 100th anniversary of independence. Of course, it later became a part of the United States, but it was independent for 10 years as a nation. And <clears throat> while, while there, I, I had a chance to be within about three feet of President Roosevelt when he came to our exposition, but I never mm -hmm. saw him. Mm -hmm. because we had dual duties as uh, auxiliary policemen as well as being in the band. And when they came, our orders were to face the crowd and be prepared to dive in on anyone that acted suspiciously. And so his limousine passed right behind my back, and I knew it. I could hear it as it went by, but I never saw him because mm -hmm. I was watching the crowd. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> while working on my master's degree at the University of Texas, why well, there's a young lady named Virginia Dare Collins who was working on her master's degree in biology, particularly in botany. And we got to know each other very well. And we, she helped me with my thesis for my master's degree. And we married, and I helped her with her thesis, although she got hers was delayed a little bit because of her devoting attention to helping me. And we had our first son named Alan 
now in Robert Horton. I didn't realize that at the time he was suffering from severe allergies. I had gotten a fellowship at Columbia to get a degree at a different university from the one where I got my first two degrees. I went on up to New York and Virginia joined me up there after a short time. And Alan was getting worse. He had infantile eczema so severely that it was like having poison ivy over your entire body all the time. He had to be restrained with aluminum mitts on his hands because of terrible scratching and restraints. It was a terrible ordeal. Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center that examined him said that they thought he was the most severe allergy patient that had ever survived. We tried everything we could to try to get it through the problem. We changed to goat's milk. We used soybeans. We finally found that while we we did keep him alive with the soybean mixture and apple juice, but anything else we tried reacted terribly. The soybean-apple juice combination with vitamins kept him alive, but did not permit him to grow normally. He was very thin and fragile all his, all his, all his life. About this same time, I, I, had, the, I had the good fortune to see the first cyclotron in Cuban Physics Laboratory, disassembled one weekend and unguarded, and I had a chance to see the principal on which it operated. I also went down to Radio City and saw the world's first electron microscope. It was used to use vacuum tubes and occupied a full room of equipment, but I saw a magnification of tobacco mosaic virus magnified 250,000 diameters compared to the difficulty of getting only two or three thousand diameters with optical techniques where they were doing genetic research at the University of Texas. On vacation, I told, summer vacation, I told the people at the University of Texas this, that if they wanted to maintain their leadership in genetic research, they should get an electron microscope. They did not get it, and they continued to work with violet light and, and high magnification of op optical techniques, getting maybe three or four thousand diameters magnification, which had gotten them in the lead in the first place in genetic research using Drosophila melanogaster fruit flies as the, the short life cycle medium for doing the research. And they took advantage of the fact that the salivary glands of Drosophila melanogaster are already about a hundred diameters larger than the other cells of the body, so that they got an initial magnification from the biological characteristics of the specimen in addition to the optical characteristics. They never got the electron microscope and they lost their leadership, world leadership in genetics. <coughs> in addition to the cyclotron and the electron microscope, I had the good fortune to be present at one of the earliest demonstrations by <coughs> Armstrong of frequency modulation radio. I was completely convinced by the tone quality of the system that it would be something for the future. Armstrong had been kicked out of Radio City for because they thought he was wasting the company's time working on frequency modulation. Of course, it later came to be very important for military direct line short distance communications on a secure basis and also, of course, serves the purpose of all communities now for high quality broadcasting in the local area. <coughs> While this was going on, Alan's condition continued to be very bad. At the same time, about this time now, Pearl Harbor occurred. And the next morning, I went down to Center City, New York, to see what I could do to get in. And I found a line about six or eight men abreast that wrapped around several blocks waiting to get in to see the Navy recruiting officer. I went back home and realized that perhaps I should do something different, especially in view of Alan's very bad health and his life-threatening condition. About this time, without my knowing it, C.D. Simmons, who had been a professor of statistics at the University of Texas when I was, just before I was there, I had not had him as a professor. He was controller of the university while I was there, handling the multi-million dollar oil assets of the university and investing them wisely. He had been asked by a former dean of the School of Business who preceded me at the university named Spurgeon Bell. Mm -hmm.
Spurgeon Bell was head economist of the National Resources Planning Board in President Roosevelt's executive office. And Spurgeon Bell had asked C.D. Simmons to make a recommendation for somebody to be his executive assistant mm -hmm. in his job. And C.D. Simmons had told him that he should get in touch with me. Spurgeon Bell called me in New York, and I made one or two trips to Washington, D.C., and concluded that in view of the situation, I should, uh, the world situation, Pearl Harbor and the Japanese War and everything, mm -hmm. I should do something other than just trying to work on my doctorate. Mm -hmm. And so I moved, I moved to the Washington area, bought a house in Silver Spring, Maryland, and went to work for Spurgeon Bell as his executive assistant. <coughs> Alan's health remained very bad. I remember the sad situation that when he was three years old, he only weighed about one pound more than he had at 18 months. Mm -hmm. But he was a very intelligent boy, and I still remember, and very imaginative, I still remember his first Christmas at Silver Spring when he had temporary relief from his constant itching, but he was developing serious asthma at that time. I still remember that <coughs> His first Christmas at about age three, he took a chair and moved it right up to the Christmas tree so that his knees were touching the limbs of the Christmas tree. He was so fascinated. Mm -hmm. And we made a picture of him studying the Christmas tree firsthand, mm -hmm. close range. <clears throat> My duties at the National Resources Planning Board included very a lot of classified work. We wrote a quarterly report President Roosevelt on various things. One very serious thing was ship sinkings, and I was asked to make an analysis of how long it would take for our shipbuilding program to exceed the rate at which ships were being sunk. Mm -hmm. and of course, I had access to the catastrophic ship sinkings. In this connection, I was I was impressed by the fact that the American people were so uncaring about the welfare of their forces at sea that they continued to have bright lights all up and down the east coast so that the German submarines that had left the Atlantic to come over and prey on our coast were sinking large numbers of American ships silhouetted against American illum illuminated coastlines. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. an incredibly stupid thing to let happen mm -hmm. and cost thousands of lives and hundreds of millions of dollars in material and jeopardized the supply line to Great Britain. Mm -hmm. uh, I made my reports and plotted when it would be possible to exceed the ship sinkings, and I got another assignment. Uh, Mr. Bell had asked, he was head economist, and he had asked one of the, some of the senior employees who outranked me by four or five grades mm -hmm. to estimate when the war in Europe would occur, when the war in the Pacific would occur, and what would be the national debt and interest load at the termination of the war. They came back estimating the war in Europe would be over in 60, in 43 and the war in Japan in 44. Spurgeon Bell had been a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army in World War I, and he knew that that was absurd. Mm -hmm. He also knew that I had a, a reserve officer's training corps background, mm -hmm. and he regarded me as being fairly intelligent, so he transferred the assignment to me, even though I was the junior economist on the staff. Mm -hmm. I was called, a, uh, I had, I think at that point I was still an assistant economist, had not been promoted to associate economist. Uh -huh. But he gave me the job, and <coughs> with my knowledge of history and military problems and things like that, and seeing the way the war was going in Europe, mm -hmm. I estimated at the time that the war in Europe would be finished in the latter part of 1944, and the war in in Japan would be finished in the latter part of 1940, uh, 1946. Mm -hmm. 44 and 46 were my estimates. Mm -hmm. I knew nothing about the Manhattan District, the atomic bomb, mm -hmm. and I've made the forecast on the basis of what I knew. Right. Mm -hmm. they, on the basis of these calculations and the rate at which we were spending money, I had recommended that since we could not shoot tomorrow's bullets today, that we should try to pay for the bullet, pay for the war as we went through to avoid inflation. Mm -hmm. It was considered political, and I made this recommendation, which fell on, fell on, on fell on ground because 
it is not politically feasible. It would be too much of a shock to the American people to have to pay for the war as it went along, even though they were having to make the bullets to be used as uh -huh. they went along. Uh -huh. That was my logic. So I recommended then that instead of a voluntary savings program, that the savings for the campaign for buying U.S. savings bonds be made a compulsory savings bond like an income tax, but you just got a bond instead of being taxed. Right. And that that was ter termed to be politically unfeasible, too. Uh -huh. If it had been done, it would have prevented the post-war inflation that occurred. I knew the inflation that occurred after World War I, and I wanted to avoid that after World War II, but mm -hmm. that recommendation was also disallowed on political reasons. Mm -hmm. We have continued to live that kind of life for most of my, for nearly all of my life, uh, failing to face reality as we should. Mm -hmm. However, based on my figures, which turned out to be erroneous, because I didn't know about the atomic bomb and other things, but for 44 and 46, it turned out that I averaged about right. I estimated that the national debt at the end of World War II would be $300 billion, and that the annual interest load, they were keeping interest rates down by financial management, would be $6 billion per year. Those were formidable figures in those days, for example, the, nas the gross national product in 1932 at the bottom of the Depression, the total gross national product of the entire nation had been $32 billion. Hmm. Hmm. So these were massive hmm. figures at right. the time. Right. <clears throat> Mr. Bell accepted my figures and put them in the quarterly report. They're probably in the National Archives now. It turned out that the war, that the national debt it turned out that instead of winning in Europe in 44, we won in the early part of 1945. Uh -huh. But of course, I had not known that we were going to let the Germans get through on the Battle of the Bulge, which was unnecessary if we had good intelligence. Right. So the war in Europe lasted a little longer than I had forecast. Uh -huh. On the other hand, the war in Japan, which I had estimated it would take us two years to turn things around and hit mm -hmm. Japan with full force, mm -hmm. it turned out that because of the atomic bomb, the war in Japan ended in the latter part of 1945. Mm -hmm. So both wars ended, both major campaigns ended in 1945 instead of one in 44 and 46. Mm -hmm. they, these two errors tended to counterbalance each other, and it turned out that the actual national debt at the end of World War I was approximately $275 billion, and the annual interest load was approximately $5.5 billion. Hmm. These things, of course, were may sound trivial in retrospect, but it made a significant impression on Spurgeon Bell, who at the end of World War II wanted me to come back and join his staff. At that time, he had transferred over to the Interstate Commerce Commission, and, and it led to my being employed on his staff after World War II. Mm. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Allen's condition was very bad, and we had him to other doctors, and our home physician in Bartlett, Texas, said, let me know if he lives. In other words, he didn't think he would live. Mm. Uh, Even well, after he was three, yes. there was still oh, questions. Yeah. His asthma got much worse. The eczema stayed about the same. Uh, a little better so that he was not scratching all the time, but the asthma got much worse. And uh, while this was going on also, Virginia had many miscarriages and one or two stillbirths, and so it turned out, we found out later, we didn't know at the time what was going on, but it turned out later that something that we was hardly known at the time, she was Rh negative and I was mm -hmm. Rh positive and we were biologically, chemically incompatible, mm -hmm. even though she, and she was one of the finest people I have ever known in my whole life. Mm -hmm. Mm. In Washington, I worked for a little more than a year, and then because of my psychology and interests and the way the war was going, mm -hmm. I went over to enlist in the services, although I needed to get a commission in order to support my family. Uh -huh. I was make, by that time I'd been promoted to a fairly high level as an economist, and I saw that even as an officer I'd have to take a cut in pay, but I wanted to do it. And so I started getting physical examinations with the Army and the Navy, and my colleagues in the, remember this is in RTV in the executive office of President Roosevelt, and I had done a good job, 
They said, you're crazy. You're married. You have a child. You're in a key position. You will never be drafted. And my reply was very simple. I said, I'm from Texas. This is the most important thing that is going to occur in my life. And as a Texan, I'll either be part of it or spend the rest of my life trying to explain why I was not part of it. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and applied for and got a commission in the Navy as ensign, the lowest rank corresponding to second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. It came through first as ensign supply corps. I went over and told them that I did not want to be in the supply corps, even though I had, even though I had a degree in business administration from the University of Texas. My interests were different from that. And I wanted, I wanted in the military, I wanted to be a line officer. I had been a line officer in military, infantry, ROTC. And I wanted to be a line officer in the Navy. They reprocessed the papers. It cost me months of time getting into the Navy, but I did go in as a line officer, U.S. Navy, as an ensign. Mm -hmm. A funny thing happened when I went back to my hometown to take, to get a place for Virginia and Allen and Charles. Charles was born by then. Uh, I walked into the bank where I'd, my father had done bank in all his life. He looked at me and saw the star for a line officer. I was just an ensign with one stripe, but the star on top looked like to the banker. He said, gee, stars already? He thought I was a, a general or an admiral or something like that already <laughs> because of that star, but all that that one star denoted above the one stripe was that I was a line officer and I was proud to be a line officer. Uh -huh. My indoctrination occurred at Ponset Point, Rhode Island. I left the family in Texas. While I was there, I was witness to a very heroic event. British airmen were training here because they couldn't train very well in Great Britain. And so, and they did, they did not behave well. They drank till late at night and then come and try to fly their hot planes early the next morning. Mm -hmm. And in doing this, one of the British aviators made a a bad landing, and his plane skidded on fire right up to the opening of a massive storage place for magazines, explosives, depth charges, torpedoes, oh. and all that sort of thing, with a heavy earthen embankment surrounding it to protect the rest of the base in case it exploded. Uh -huh. Skidded right up to the base. One of the sailors saw this happen, one of the sailors on the base, uh -huh. and he started running straight toward this burning plane at the mouth of this explosive dump and got the British pilot out of the plane and started running, carrying him for about a hundred yards. At that time, there was a moderate explosion that occurred that knocked him down, well, along with the man, he was the British officer he was carrying. He got up and started running again and got another hundred or two hundred yards away. And at that time, the big explosion occurred which shook all the buildings on the base, and I walked outside and I saw a huge smoke rain, two or three thousand feet up in the air that had blown, been blown straight up. It, the explosion was confined by the large earthen revetments that surrounded it, mm -hmm. and this sailor had gotten the officer far enough away that they survived the explosion. Hmm. Wow. I thought it was one of the bra bravest things I'd ever seen. Wow. I, I did well, they gave, <laughs> A, a test. This was the second one I'd had in my life. A rather long test. All of the officers who were being indoctrinated, <clears throat> there were 600 of us, and they gave the test to all of us. And after that test was given and scored, why, well, I didn't hear anything from it personally, but I got a message from the commander of the base that he wanted to see me. I didn't know what he wanted to see me about. I was a little uh -huh. bit nervous as to what I might have done wrong. So I went over to see him. And he looked at me, talked to me a while about my interests and what I'd like to do. And I mentioned I'd like to be a gunnery officer or a navigator mm -hmm. on a U.S. ship. But I had a mathematical background. And he smiled and said, we'll see what can be done. And, <clears throat> and then I was disappointed to find that I was assigned to training in aerological engineering, which is the advanced version of meteorology, which the Navy had developed on the basis of the research of Norwegian uh, meteorologists. They had gotten the information out of Europe and in over here, and the Navy leading and the Air Force following 
revolutionized dynamic meteorology in this country. In fact, they, they created dynamic meteorology in this country. Mm -hmm. Before that, the Weather Bureau had been part of the Department of Agriculture and about all they did was measure rainfall and snowfall and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had been, I was disappointed to find I'd been in assigned to a crash course, a one-year course, condensed from three years in what the Navy calls aerological engineering. Because of that, and the fact that no attention had been paid to my statement of preferences at the time, I concluded that that commander of the U.S. base at uh, Quonset Point had wanted to get a look at me. And the only reason why I could f figure out that he wanted to get a look at me was because I must have scored extremely high on the test that they'd given. And he wanted to see if I was um, a bookish type that they now call nerds or something different. And <laughs> He apparently was satisfied that I could m be a satisfactory line officer to the Navy. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, because of other pressures for competent, well-trained meteorologists, I was sent to the mm -hmm. postgraduate school of the Naval Academy at uh, Annapolis, Maryland, mm -hmm. where in one year they gave us the, the finest crash course in meteorology that I believe it is possible to develop. Mm -hmm. And I was the beneficiary of that. And I was assigned to the Pacific upon completion of that. And I moved the family to San Jose, California, where they lived while I was in the Pacific. I went there and was just worked at the Fleet Weather Central for a time. I had, I did, I had the reputation of doing good analysis of maps. One reason why I could do good analyses rapidly was because I noticed that the left-handed member of our class had an advantage in that he could see ahead of his hand as he moved from left to right where the what the data was, and so he could draw the fronts and the isobars and things like that quickly and accurately because of moving from left to right as a left-hander. Mm -hmm. And so I changed my style, and even though I'm right-handed, instead of moving from left to right, I analyzed from right to left, mm -hmm. and that way I achieved, achieved an advantage. Well, this advantage carried on when I was analyzing maps at the Fleet Weather Central in the outer office and they liked my work, and so they asked me to go back into the top secret room in the back. And they spread out a map of the whole Pacific Ocean in front of me, mm -hmm. and I asked the question, which was, I guess, improper. I said, why are we, and, and it was plotted, Japan, China, all everything was plotted. Mm -hmm. I said, why are we analyzing historical weather maps? He looked at me and said, the officer looked at me and said, that is midnight last night. I knew then that we were decoding all the Japanese communications in the field of meteorology wow. and probably in the others as well. Wow. Mm. I was sent down to mm. uh, the Navy base, Naval Air Station Hilo, on the Big Island of Hawaii. And for about six, seven, or eight months, I was the aerological officer for Naval Air Station Hilo, which had been activated only a few mon months before I went down there. I got a new commander and he came in and said, I'd like to see your typhoon bill. And I said, we do not have a typhoon bill, sir. And he said, why not? I said, because, partly because, I said that we have, do not have, yet have a full year's data on winds and we've never had a typhoon here, no history of them. And he said, well, what's your estimate of maximum wind speed here? I said, 45 knots. He said, how do you come by that if you don't have any data? I took him to the window and pointed to some very flimsy fumes that were used to transport sugar cane from the cane field fields to the mills where it was processed. And mm -hmm. I said, sir, he ranked me by two or three notches. I said, sir, those structures over there, what, what wind speed do you think they could survive? He smiled and looked at me and said, I see your point. 45 knots, apparently is it. We don't need a typhoon bill here for that reason. Mm -hmm. And so I went back shortly afterward, a, a tropical disturbance which had been generated off the coast of Mexico started toward, Hawaii, toward the island of Hawaii and the wind began to pick up and the cloud, clouds were scurrying across the sky and I was very, I was very worried. <laughs> I sat down and watched the anemometer and the wind twiggled, wiggled back and forth. And I knew that the station commander was also probably watching in a barometer, uh, not a barometer, but a, 
a wind speed indicator, an anemometer, I should say, mm -hmm. in his office. And it got higher and higher to 30 knots, 35 knots, and 40, and it wiggled a few times. And got up close to 45 knots, but did not quite break it, and it passed by, and I was saved. <laughs> by, the fact, by the fact that that storm shot by. Just a At that point, they were calling me back. I didn't know what for. To the Fleet Weather Central or on the island of Oahu, where the fleet, where the headquarters were located. <coughs> and the, the men in the base were so sure I was going to be assigned to the Franklin, which was later damaged heavily with tremendous casualties off Tokyo. And they were so sure I was going there that I got mail later on that was forwarded by way of the Franklin. Mm -hmm. um, I later saw, much later I saw the Franklin when she came back through and they were still digging bodies out of the wreckage that had been mm -hmm. rained on her by kamikazes and explosions. And so, and I got to know the man who became the aerological officer of oh, that. It was uh, I can't think of his name right now. He's from Waco, Texas. Mm. Uh, I may think of it later, but I can't think of it right okay. now. So, then to my surprise, instead of sending me to the Franklin, they said, you're assigned for special training at uh, <coughs> the Oceanography, Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And again, I thought, gee, another delay in getting out to where the war is being fought. Mm -hmm. and they sent me back for a crash 30-day course in, for, in forecasting sea surface swell for refueling at sea, for seaplane takeoff and landings, and uh, above all, for amphibious operations. And I got there and I found I was fortunate to be associated with some of the most brilliant men that I have ever known. Mm -hmm. One of them was... H.U. Sverger, who had been an Arctic explorer and oceanographer right after World War I, had gone under the Arctic ice pack in a conventional diesel-powered, battery-powered submarine, and had spent a winter with Eskimos in northern Siberia. Hmm. But the main thing was he was a great brain. The Navy had suffered such terrible casualties at Tarawa that they said, since we were depending upon British maps, <coughs> contour maps for water depth and they did not they were not accurate we cannot depend on anybody's maps of water depth for amphibious operations many marines drowned because they went into water off of their craft into water over their heads heavily loaded and could not get drowned others mm -hmm. were machine gunned because they were disembarked on reefs that were hundreds of yards from the japanese fire uh, fire points so the Navy made a decision, we have to get a different way of determining underwater depth. And they started trying, measuring tints of algae. They tried photographs of bomb detonations and everything. And the problem was solved by H.U. Square, who found that a, a wave that is breaking, a wave that is breaking has encountered shallow water getting shallow. If, depending upon the height of the wave, it was experiencing shallow water. And the rate of advance, the rate of advance of the breaking wave was proportional to the depth of the water at that point. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, the foam from the breaker, while it appears to be very mobile to the casual looker, actually is virtually stationary on the surface of the water. Mm -hmm. It's true that it's being elongated by the formation of more bubbles, but the place where it starts breaking is can be regarded as a stationary object. Mm -hmm. So the combination of the speed of advance being an indicator of the depth of the water and the foam forming an observation point to see how fast it's moving meant that this was the way that you could get, you could rapidly get the depth of the water. And it turns out that by taking timed aerial photographs at about three second intervals mm -hmm. and doing it in many places, not just the place that's going to be invaded, but lots of places because it's so easy to do, taking these photographs mm -hmm. inside of an hour or two, a trained oceanographer or meteorologist, which I had become, could draw underwater contour lines of depth. 
anchored mm -hmm. to one foot for any number of places, and this broke the back of the problem. Mm -hmm. I was then shipped straight out to out to the Philippines. To, uh, on the way, I had one interesting thing. Part of the way, I went on a one of the Panama Clipper seaplanes, which had been leased by Panama Clipper, uh, Panama, uh, no, not Panama, Pan American, Pan American Clippers, uh -huh. been leased to the Navy, and to my amazement, that was equipped with little bunks where you could sleep and a little tiny dining room where you could dine for breakfast. And on the way back to Hawaii, I lived the life of a rich man in a Pan, uh, Pan American Clipper airplane which had been pressed into Navy service by lease. And then I quickly got another flight from there on out to join Admiral Hall staff in the Philippines. And on the way, I flew over Saipan when I knew that Carter was down on Saipan, but we mm -hmm. could not land any. We had, we had propeller problems at Kwajalein, but they would not let us land because they were worried about an epidemic of influenza in World War II comparable to what had killed so many millions in World War I. Mm. And so we had to stay on the plane all the time during the repairs. Hang, the crewmen were hanging under the wing doing repairs while we were there. Mm. And so we got the repairs done and refueled and took off, never touching the beach, just staying in the water as a seaplane, took mm. off and mm. headed for the Philippines. And when we came in on site, we were delayed many hours by this. And the pilot who had not been west, had not been east, west of Oahu, was not very skilled. And he had not radioed about our delay, and he had not turned either. And our, I did it. Our instrument, which was called IFF, identification friend or foe, was not functioning. He had not radioed ahead to Guam and Saipan that we were without IFF. We were coming in hours behind schedule with no IFF, and we didn't. And this pilot had not communicated mm -hmm. to let them know our predicament. And we found out after we landed for a quick midnight lunch or breakfast or something that all the guns in that area had been trained on us, ready to fire if we made any <laughs> false move. But we came into the approach traffic pattern, and so they let us come on in, and we landed, even though by the strictest military rules, they should have shot us down. Wow. And they would not let us leave the base. They kept us confined behind. They let us eat, got back on the plane, seaplane, is refueled, we took off, and we proceeded on to the Philippines. In the Philippines, I went to join Admiral John L. Hall staff, and I found that he was just returning from Okinawa, where he had run the heavy casualty Okinawa campaign. And I, meanwhile, I was at the Fleet Weather Central, Manila, while he was coming back to prepare his staff for the invasion of the home islands of Japan. Mm -hmm. I think this is probably a good place to pause. Okay. You don't want to hear the rest of the war, do you? <laughs> In the Philippines, while, while going to the Philippines, I had the benefit of seeing our tremendous power on the Pacific Ocean. We had already begun to deploy our major forces for the heavy invasion of Japan, and we were never out of sight of an American convoy for more than 10 or 15 minutes, despite the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we <coughs> did have one near mishap coming into Luzon. The plane was fairly heavily loaded, and <coughs> We'd been refueled at Saipan, and the pilot started up a valley which he thought was a pass through the mountains to the other side. And we got close, the trees got closer and closer to us, and we just barely got through. It was not a pass. It was. It turned out it was a stream bed that was on our side of the mountain. And fortunately, we did manage to get over the ridge and onto the other side, mm -hmm. and landed, and. I report into Fleet Weather Central. I quickly found the difference between the behavior of Navy personnel and Army personnel at that time. <laughs> Remember, at that time, Army personnel, Army personnel were still uh, Air Force personnel were part of the Army, and my brother Carter was in the Army Air Force. <clears throat> the Navy fellows had taken corrugated iron used for Quonset huts 
-hmm. and flatten it on asphalt roads with trucks mm -hmm. so that they could make structures with flat sheet metal, not only, and they used it to make showers and soldered it together to, and welded it together to make basins mm -hmm. and shower basins and things like that. And they also had a lot of pipe, but they didn't have any fittings, no elbow joints and no faucets or anything like that. Uh -huh. But they had improvised elbow joints by taking diagonal cuts of the pipe and welding the pipe together so that they'd have a sharp corner for in place of an elbow jo joint. Mm -hmm. And they also had improvised faucets so that they, they had a, might have a fountain which would bubble up but with a weight and a lever on the end of it, why there'd be a, ga there'd be a gasket that'd hold the pressure down and they managed to get the water pumped up to a tank which supplied us. And meanwhile, <laughs> the Army hadn't done any of this. They, they thought, oh, gee, it was just pipe and corrugated iron, there's nothing we can do. But the Navy had shown what you could do. I think <laughs> they copied them after they saw what had been done. Uh -huh. I also was a little careless. I lose on just about 20 miles north of Manila, there was still a rather large Japanese army that had not surrendered and had not been annihilated. And I walked around. I was. Our headquarters was going to be at. Uh, Suribao, which is north of Manila Bay. Our fleet weather center was down at Manila, Manila, Manila itself. And I frequently commuted between those two places without arms, just hitching rides on jeeps and things like that. And mm -hmm. it, in retrospect, it was foolish. I did another foolish thing at that time, too. Outside of Manila, there was a Japanese underground bunker. And I went to see how they lived, and I went down and walked through it. Now, it was crazy because I could have been knocked off with a booby trap. Mm. I, so I can impart this wisdom to others so they won't make a similar mistake. I was lucky. <laughs> I was just lucky. <laughs> Sounds like you've had a lot of lucky episodes. Another thing happened too, that it, which helped to make me too complacent, I guess. As a means of amuse, showing their gratitude for liberation, the Manila Symphony Orchestra had reconstituted itself, and in their Manila was virtually destroyed, and their building had one wall knocked off completely. But nevertheless, in their auditorium, just on about the second or third floor, the Manila Symphony assembled and gave a concert. And I always remember sitting in that concert hall with one wall missing on the side, a big concert mm -hmm. hall, and they played excellent music, and I enjoyed it very much. Uh, they were very grateful to Americans for having liberated them, although I believe that if we had bypassed them, and gone straight to Japan, they would have gotten by with fewer casualties and much, much less damage. But MacArthur had said he would return, and so he returned, even though Nimitz would have cut across from Guam and Saipan straight to Okinawa, mm -hmm. and uh, Formosa, and then Okinawa in Japan. And that was the direct route which, as a naval officer, I, I preferred. In the Philippines, well, we were getting ready to to invade Japan. We were preparing for invasion, and we had three-dimensional maps of the area we were going to hit. And the best way I can describe it would be, if you can imagine West Virginia with a seacoast, that was the way the southern beaches of Kyushu looked. Mm -hmm. And anybody who estimates, as the people at the Smithsonian did, that we would have had 29,000 casualties is an imbecile. Mm -hmm. There had been, I believe there had been 95,000 deaths in the Okinawa campaign. Mm -hmm. And hitting Kyushu would have been far worse than Okinawa, although Okinawa was terrible. Incidentally, the Navy lost about 70 destroyers in the campaign wow. against Okinawa. The campaign lasted 70 days and they lost a destroyer a day. Mm -hmm. The word in the destroyer fleet was that a picket, a picket boat destroyer out to give advance warning by radar was never relieved. It was always replaced. It even got to the point where they had sent out an LCM with medical personnel on board to trail them, to try to, to try to pick up survivors or wounded and stuff like that. 
the LCM is small enough the Japanese would not waste a kamikaze, a suicide bomber on it, mm -hmm. and so the medical personnel were in a smaller amphibious craft to try to help as best they could the survivors of the one on the destroyer when it was hit. Mm -hmm. It was one of the most terrible naval campaigns of the entire war. And it was while I was there that I learned that Oldendorf had saved the day in Lady Gulf by crossing the enemy's T when Halsey had been lured up toward Japan by a feint that the Japanese had engineered for the specific purpose of luring him away. Halsey, Halsey should be faulted, not merely for being lured away, but also for not notifying the other admirals down at Lady that he was abandoning San Bernardino Strait, leaving it, mm -hmm. leaving it open. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the other half of it, which was coming through Surigao Strait, was handled by Oldendorf and his fleet, and mm -hmm. also, fortunately, the light forces of LCVs, light aircraft carriers, and dis destroyers and destroyer escorts, managed to make such aggressive attacks against the Japanese fleet who came in sight of the American carriers before they even knew they were in the vicinity and had them under shell fire, mm -hmm. that the Japanese admiral thought that they must be backed by heavier stuff to be acting in that foolhardy manner. Mm -hmm. And after, after shelling and sinking two or three carriers and cruisers, he turned and went back to, to avoid being trapped. Uh. Uh, one of my friends, who was damage control officer on one of the light aircraft carriers that was sunk, said that they were hit by at least 50 heavy caliber shells before they had to order abandoned ship. I asked him, how in the world did, you, did a light aircraft carrier survive that many heavy hits? He says, because Japanese were expecting heavier stuff, and they had delayed action fuses and armor-piercing projectiles and the projectiles would hit on one side, go through the ship, out the other side, and explode in the water after going through the ship, both sides yeah. of the ship. And he, as damage control oh. officer, he said, we didn't have to abandon the ship until we'd taken 50 major hits, hmm. which must be a record. Hmm. Hmm. Well, <coughs> we, <coughs> we were getting ready to invade Japan, and I happened to be I was getting all my records ready for it, studying the typhoon tracks and everything like that. When I <coughs> when I went back to Fleet Weather Central for perhaps the last time before <coughs> going north at sea yeah. back on the flagship, why <coughs> when I was there the teletype teletype radio teletype started clattering. I went over to see what it was being typed. And what was being typed on the tel teletype was simply this. Don't spread it around or it will be my, I'll suffer. But the Japs say that they will surrender if we'll let them keep their emperor. I tore this off and ran into the room where the fellows were looking at a movie. I said, fellows, the war is ending. I shouted. They said, get out of here. Quit bothering us. We're watching this movie and they would not come out. They thought I was pulling their leg. Mm. It wasn't until after the movie was over that they got out and found out that I was the one that was right. <laughs> they had missed the teletype transmission which foretold the ending of the war. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when this happened, I went back. At this point, because we were ready to invade, Admiral Hall was designated to land the heavy landing force, the one that was going to have landed on the beaches of Kyushu, was now going to go straight into Tokyo Bay. Mm -hmm. And as we got ready to leave, MacArthur used his rank to jerk Admiral Hall's <coughs> flagship out because he wanted that for his communication ship in Tokyo. Admiral Hall was extremely angry, mm -hmm. as you might expect. Yeah. And he had to transfer his flag to an APA, which is a larger ship, but a less commodious ship. The, the flagship really had some condition, some areas that were air conditioned. <laughs> and so we transferred to the APA. I almost missed it because not realizing it, I, I didn't use the air conditioned offices more ordinarily. But I go in there to write some letters, and I suddenly realized I hadn't heard the bullhorn speak. I ran out and said, hey, what about the bullhorn? Any message? Yeah. 
and I just barely, uh, by getting on, as they were pulling apart, the two ships were pulling apart, I got on the life raft on the on our flagship, the Teton, and swung over to the Hansford, and I had I had previously, fortunately, transferred all my gear and gone back to air-conditioned space just to write letters, and I transferred myself across in that unusual manner and got on the Hansford so that I did not get into trouble, and <laughs> we took off then for what was to be the what was to be the trip up to Japan. Uh -huh. The admiral called me into his office and said. Um, can we do this on schedule? The surrender was scheduled for August the 31st, which happens to be my birthday. Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, sir, we can do so. He said, how about these typhoons? I said, well, sir, this one is going, we're going to be steaming out to the north of Luzon. I had been tracking the, a number of typhoons. I said, this one's going to be just ahead of us. It's traveling at about 15 knots. And this one's coming in behind, but it's far enough behind us. We can cut in right between the two and steam at 15 knots and turn into Tokyo Bay just before this second one catches up. And he looked at me silently, nodded, and I left. And it's clear that he was relying on my forecast. <laughs> it, <laughs> better not be off In retrospect, much. it reminds me of that episode <laughs> at NNAS Hilo when I forecast the maximum wind velocity of 45 knots. <laughs> well, we... We steamed, <coughs> we steamed out and off northern Luzon. We were on our way, typhoon ahead of us and one behind us. And at the time, I thought that someone at a higher rank level above my own admiral had gotten cold feet. And we got a message to delay the entire operation 48 hours. Mm -hmm. I have since found out that the military situation was so hazardous in in Japan with fanatics wanting to attack the Americans in a suicide march and mm -hmm. combat that I think now that that is the reason why it was delayed 48 hours to give the Japanese more time to get control of their own forces before we started landing. Mm -hmm. But at the time I thought, well, gee, somebody's gotten cold feet. They don't believe my forecast. But I stayed up all night to watch what the, how the Admiral handled. We had a huge mass of ships there, around a hundred of them, I guess that had never been in formation before. The war wasn't over. We were still on blackouts, and there were Japanese submarines that still hadn't gotten any message about atomic bomb or anything like that. And I wanted to see how he handled this. And by the way, there were no running lights. So I wanted to see how he handled this thing, turning a massive convoy 180 degrees in the middle of the night before the war was over. And I saw how he did it. He did it by have giving an order to turn 10 degrees to port and wait until everyone is straightened out and then 15, 20 minutes later another 10 degrees to port. Mm. And so he did that 18 times to make his 180 degree turn the whole end. They did not have any collision, no casualties, and we steamed back and went into Manila Bay again. Mm. <laughs> and we got there just in time to get the orders that the surrender had been rescheduled for September the 2nd and we steamed out on schedule to just make it into Tokyo Bay the night before the surrender the night of September 1 and 2 and we steamed on radar fixes we steamed into Tokyo Bay and stood at anchor and I had the privilege of being in Tokyo Bay watching through binoculars as the Japanese Empire surrendered on the Missouri mm -hmm. and watching while thousands of American planes were soaring overhead and hundreds of U.S. ships were anchored all over Tokyo Bay. Mm -hmm. The most impressive per mm -hmm. portrayal of military might, I guess, in history. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget that. I never, I, I thought that this set the United States for the next few centuries. I had no idea that we would fall down as fast as we have, mm. internally and externally. Mm. I thought that we had done the job which would last for not a thousand years, as Hitler had forecast for Germany, but at least would last for a century or so for us. Mm. <clears throat> when we, after the surrender, as soon as the 
surrender to ceremony was completed on the Missouri, instantly Admiral Hall, my boss, came on the ha bullhorn aloud and it could be heard even above the roar of the diesel engines of the amphibious craft. We had, by this time, we had thousands and thousands of men in amphibious craft ready to hit the beach as soon as the surrender was complete. Mm -hmm. And they were ordered to hit it as if it were a potential hostile landing because we didn't know what was what had happened to those fanatics. Mm -hmm. The Japanese were supposed to clear the beach for 2,000 yards and they did a pretty good job of that. And as soon as the treat, peace treaty was signed, Admiral Hall's big voice came on, the loudspeaker could be heard all over that part of the Tokyo Bay, said, land the landing force. Mm -hmm. And vroom, the diesel roared and they went in and <laughs> I went to the ship's armory to try to see what kind of arms were left. I wanted to get a sidearm at least. I didn't want to go into Japan unarmed. All the sidearms were gone. The only thing left was <laughs> Springfield rifle. But with infantry ROTC at Tarleton, I was well trained with the Springfield, and I liked that gun very much. And I considered myself better armed with the Springfield rifle than I would have been with a sidearm. <laughs> and so I went, I, I landed in Japan with this good old Springfield Model, model 19, 30.06, Model 19.3, I believe it was. Uh -huh. <laughs> and there's a, somewhere in Japan, there was a fellow who was treated nicely by the first American he ever saw. He was a harbor pilot, and he had not gotten the word about clearing the beaches for 2,000 yards. And he was in a little cupola about the size of a telephone booth. Uh -huh. And he was sitting in there with his Japanese hat on, Japanese style hat, they were different than from ours. Uh -huh. And as I walked by his place, I was walking through Yokohama, and Yokohama was flat. It was flat like a corrugated building that is burned to the ground, and all this rusty stuff is lying around, and his little telephone-sized cupola was standing up. 95% of Yokohama was flat as if you had run a bulldozer over it and mm -hmm. burned it. <clears throat> I walked up I walked up to, to him and saw that he must be innocent, his lunchbox was parked outside of his little booth. And I walked up to him and called his attention and pointed down to his lunchbox and waved my fingers like the wings of a bird to let him know that if he left his lunchbox there, somebody would take it as a souvenir. Mm -hmm. And so somewhere in Japan, there's a man about my age, or a little older, if he's still alive, who can tell his descendants that his lunchbox was saved because of the kindness of an American naval officer who called his attention to the fact that it was exposed outside his booth. <laughs> By the way, I just want to say that the tape just ended. Okay. Uh, and I want to double check. <laughs>